Here at Mosquito Farm, we have a real passion to drive diversity into our grass swords, and that's what this question's all about. So here in Mosquito, we really don't just want to have grass in our farm. We have what we call a Pasture for Life accredited no-till farm. Now that means that we don't plough, we don't plant cereals and we don't feed our cows any cereal products either. It means that the girls, our Mosquito girls, really must survive and thrive on what we can grow on the farm here, and that's it. Now in our swords, what we are trying to do is every year, we are trying to increase the diversity, which means the different types of plants in the grass that the cows are grazing. Now the question itself is actually for the sword like this. So this is actually the field I was standing in the day that that photograph was taken that you're asking about. Now behind me we've got Italian grasses, we've got fescue grasses, which are very old fashioned meadow grasses. We have things like plantain, we have chicory, we have clover. However, at this time of year, unfortunately, it's too cold for a lot of these grasses to grow. So they're sort of in hibernation, just sort of living the dream a wee bit and just waiting for the nice warm summer to come, as we all are. Now, to explain a little bit more about why we're trying to do this, not just grow a little bit of grass, I'm going to jump into the office with my whiteboard and tell you a little bit more. So, here we are, a whiteboard in the Moscow Farm office. So back in the field, I explained that we try and use different types of grass and herbs to feed the mosquito girls to produce our gold standard milk. Now, it was quite difficult to explain that in the field because at this time of year, where herbs and grasses aren't really growing up very well, the mosquito girls are in the big barn and they're being fed in something called ensiled grass, which means it's grass that we harvest during the summer and we feed during the winter after it's fermented for a little while and dried out a little. So, just to explain a little bit about what we do and why we do it, I've got my whiteboard here, my pen, and my awful drawing skills. So, I'm going to start off with the grass plant. So, here we are, a very typical piece of grass with three leaves on it. Now, the importance of three leaves here is that in the dairy industry, we have discovered that the grass itself has the highest energy and protein content when it's at what we call the three leaf stage. So when we go out to the fields and we discover that the plant's at this stage, it's got three leaves there, and it's looking very green and very lush, that's when we traditionally want to get the cows into it to be able to feast and really take the benefit of that energy and the protein that's in there. Now, the, the issue with that is, it's a very narrow nutritional profile. And generally, we have to supplement the cows with minerals or other types of feed to keep their full nutritional range up. And also, in the dairy industry nowadays, where prices are constantly being pushed to the floor, we have to make sure that what we feed the cows is highly efficient. Now, at Miss Gill, we've got a very, very lucky stance where we have a direct relationship with you. And because of that relationship, we can do something a little bit different because we really feel that we, there might just be another way to do it here. Now, what we do is, we do have our grasses. However, we don't actually put our cows in at this stage. We let our grasses grow a little and grow a little bit more. And then once the grass is up here, so generally we would graze the grass when it's round about here, our cows are coming in a lot higher up. Now, the issue with that is that the energy and the protein levels are lower in the grass. And of course, that's going to be an issue for us because to keep our animals healthy and to keep them producing milk, to be able to feed their calves and us when they're gold standard milk when we bottle it, then, you know, we have to keep the energy and protein up. We can't, we, can't, we can't risk being bad to our cows and risking animal welfare by grazing their own types of grass. So what, how do we manage this? How do we do something a bit different? Well, we don't just have grass in our swords. We've also got something called clover. Now, we all know clover because you get lucky clover and, you know, everyone's loving the clover. It's a great thing. It's a tremendous plant. It's very high in protein. And it also takes nitrogen and puts nitrogen into the soil. The soil being a living, breathing organism, once the nitrogen's in there, it can then feed the grass. And it's not just us that have discovered that, this is something that's been known for decades in our industry. And a lot of farmers use this method as well. However, we don't just stop there. And we don't just have one type of grass. We have more types of grass, so we use a very old grass. When one of them is called a meadow fescue, which is something that my grandfather would have planted back in his days in the 40s, 50s and 60s when he was first learning to farm as well. And meadow fescue is a very tall grass, so again, it's growing taller. However, meadow fescue and clover and our Italian grasses grow at different levels and they mature at different levels as well, which means that if we take one day, say in May, for example, in mid-May, when this grass heals at its perfect time, the, the meadow fescue grass might be young and not growing as quickly and the clover hasn't quite come out yet, then that's got a particular nutritional range. 
If we go into the same field a month later in June, then the Italian grasses might have shot and seeded. The meadow fescues might be just behind that and the clover would be very rich and ready to come out and really full of protein. So that means that if our cows graze this in the middle of May and then come back and graze it in the middle of June, there might be two different nutritional profiles because the grasses have all changed. Now what we also do is, we also have chicory, broadleaf, and we have lots of other types of plants which I won't bore you about, but we know they're there. So that means that when our cows come along and they take a bite of this grass and, and all these herbs, we're trying to make sure that they get the full nutritional range so that they get the energy, they get the protein, they get all the micro and macronutrients that we need to keep them healthy and to produce the delicious, this gill gold milk that we produce. Now, it's not just about trying to keep our animals healthy and, and keep the milk coming out of them to be efficient. We also can use this system to, do, to stop using nitrogen fertilizer as well, so artificial fertilizer. Now, here at Miskeel, we have been organic now for coming up in three years, which means that we haven't actually used organ uh, inorganic fertilizers for a long time. However, it left us with a massive problem. So back in the day when we first started becoming organic, we really struggled to grow grass, and that's because we couldn't use fertilizers. Now, the issue with that, obviously, is if we can't grow grass, we can't feed our animals. If we can't feed our animals, we have to buy the feed in, which means it's very expensive, and it's, it's a way that we can't farm because it's just not commercially viable. So, when we realised that we could potentially use different plants to do it, we thought we were really onto something there. So this is why we've started planting diverse plants. Now I mentioned earlier that the clover can drive nitrogen into the soil for the other plants to use. Now the reason that this can happen is because soil is a living, breathing organism. And it's got lots of worms in it. It's got little types of other microbes and, and microbial activity. It's got fungus in it. Now, if there's a scientist watching this, it's very it's very up there in fungus. I know, I know, my drawing skills are horrendous. However, please bear with me. We've got, also got lots of different types of bacteria in there. In fact, there could be millions and millions of types of living and breathing organisms in my soil. Now, the great thing about that is all these little organisms and everything and all these fungus all sort of talk and network and chat and pass nutrients to each other. So if, for clover, for example, to drive nitrogen into the soil for the other plants to use, it's taking these nutrients across the soil for all the plants to use. And other plants can do different things. So if you think about it, you can, for your soil, your plants can be solar panels for the sun because we all know what photosynthesis is. It's photosynthesis starts with the sun. It's driven into the soil through the plant. What else is driven into the soil through the plant? Carbon. Now we all know, and we all learned in primary school, that carbon CO2 is taken in by plants and then released as oxygen so that we can breathe and remain healthy. And it's not just plants here, there's also trees and the flowers in our gardens as well. Sorry, horrendous drawings. I'm trying my best. Now the benefit to this is if we're able to use diverse plants, all sequestrating carbon and sequestrating nutrients at different rates, then we can have a really teeming, very healthy soil without the use of artificial fertilizers, but also feeding our animals on it. Now, the, the big thing in the news at the minute, as you, you've probably noticed, is the animal rights and environmentalist movement quite generally blame livestock for a lot of the carbon emissions that we produce. Now, the, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I'm not going to get into that right now in this video. However, you could argue, you know, why not just leave nature to it? She'll do this naturally. Just leave her and, and get rid of the animals and, and crack on. Well, the thing about that is, we can't eat grass. We can't eat clover. We can't eat other, other herbs. However, to try and do it in this way, we wouldn't be able to have the diversity and then um, retain that for, for human consumption. So we therefore use animals. Now, the great thing about it is, once animals come along, they eat the tops of these plants that we're allowing to grow a bit longer than we normally would in the dairy industry. Now what they're also doing is, they're also leaving along big piles of poo. And in that poo is the nutrients that can feed the plants and jumpstart this whole process which helps the plants draw carbon into the soil, use photosynthesis to get nutrients across the whole profile to then feed our animals a very healthy diet which grows very efficiently and very effectively in Scotland because we've got sun, sometimes, and we've got lots and lots of rain. So we here at Mesquil have the perfect ability to be able to use grazing animals to graze plants and other herbs and grasses very naturally, using healthy soils, and then working with our environment and nature 
to create really tasty nutritious food. Now of course, I could stand there all day and talk about the theory of the whiteboard until the cows come home. Literally. However, at the end of the day, we've only really been farming in this way for the past 18 months to two years, and a lot more research and study must be done into this way of farming to discover its true sustainability. Now, I personally believe completely in this way of farming, and the changes that I have seen in our family farm have been absolutely profound. So, I'm an absolute believer. Now, what we have to do as a business and as a way of life is to find researchers and academics out there who are willing to work with us to come to our farm to research our soils, see our system in action and tell us and find out and measure exactly how much of a benefit this is to our environment. We are going to fight and we're going to do this over the next few years and we're going to keep you updated as we do so. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs>